Thank you. 
to you, then you will be about receiving it. I don't know. So we don't know how this is going to go, but I, I want to start with, uh, we want to talk about, we're, we're continuing our series from a few weeks ago. We took some time away from it because of the holiday season with uh, Palm Sunday and then, and then uh, the Easter service last week. Didn't we have a great, wonderful Easter service? It was so, Caleb and I were talking, we want to continue this series uh, called Unfinished. And really part of, of our daily lives, we'll get into it since some of you weren't with us at the very beginning of starting this, this series. And I'll get to that in just a moment to kind of bring you up to par with that. But I want to start out, and, and uh, John read from the, the NIV, I'm going to read from the KJV, the old King James, not the 1611. I can't read that name. Um, but I'm going to read from the King James because this is how I learned these verses. I, I memorized these verses. I don't know if I have them all memorized still, but I, I memorized them. And there's some words that we find in the King James that that we're going to bring out for this, this sermon that we have today. So let's start with uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And we're talking about framing our hearts. Okay, and uh, we're going to talk about Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Say that, church. Faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Here's the verse right here. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And we'll, we'll go through all of that right now. Now I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. Don't get all excited. All you Pentecostals out there, don't get too excited, okay? As I'm reading this. But uh, we'll save that for later, alright? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I love these verses right here. Wherefore, seeing we also are passed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is what? That is set before us. Now watch this. Looking unto Jesus. Amen. Say it. Look at your neighbor and say, let's look to Jesus. Alright? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set, what? Before him endured the cross. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? I think of those verses and what I want to do, this is kind of like these verses here, Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 3 and Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 are like a sandwich. How many of you like to eat sandwiches? Alright? How many of you like how many of you like bread on both sides? How many you, all right? um, unless it's toast. It's, if it's toast, I love peanut butter. Okay? I absolutely love peanut butter. And I love making toast and putting peanut butter on the toast. Now, if it's like that, I only have one side of, of bread. But if I'm going to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, all right, some of you do it differently than what I do. I, I put that peanut butter thick on that one side, and I go in there, and, and I lick that, 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 that knife, and I go into that. No, I don't do that. <laughs> I go into that jelly, you know, I wipe it off, okay? I go into that jelly, and I pile that jelly on top of the peanut butter. Now, some people, they'll put peanut butter on one side and jelly on the other side, and they bring it together, and they combine it, okay? That's how some... How many of you do that? You're sick. <laughs> what we like to do is we like to pile that on one piece of bread, and then we put the other bread on top of it, and we just smush it down and get your good old glass of milk. Oh, I'm getting hungry. Come on now. Yeah. I'm getting hungry. So we get that, and we're going to call this like a sandwich. Okay? We have Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. That's the bottom side of that sandwich. And then we're going to have the top side, the top piece of bread, is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, because that's the top of what we're going to talk about. Now that good old peanut butter and jelly is in the middle of Hebrews chapter 11. All the way down through 11 
and going into 12. So it's kind of like that sandwich is that, that's what we're making. So what we're doing is we're building that. And I love the one verse that says that we're running a race. Amen. We're running a race that is set before us. So we have to physically get in shape to run that race. And part of running the race in life is understanding what faith is. Now, a lot of people, they get that mixed up when they talk about faith. They talk about, okay, I have faith. All right. We, you know, the biggest uh, piece of the puzzle with faith is understanding when we believe in Jesus Christ. Now, none of us in this room have ever seen Jesus Christ in the flesh. We've never seen Jesus Christ up close and, and talking to him. And, and so by faith, that's believing in something that we haven't seen. It's the invisible of our life, but we still believe it. Like this morning, I got up and I was thinking, man, we're going to have church today. So God, I thank you for what we're going to experience today before it even happened. And when we got in here and we started singing and you guys were singing and the band was playing and the Spirit of God was moving, I was sitting there going, that's what I thank you for earlier today because it was going to happen. You see, it's believing in something that we can't see, yet we know in our hearts that it's going to happen and it's going to take place. That's the substance of things that are hoped for, okay, and the things that are not seen. But I love the part where Paul says, hey, and I believe that Paul is the writer of Hebrews because he's just, he's a man of God. And, and the teachings that you find in Hebrews are like Paul's teaching. And I truly believe, now you may not believe that, but that's what I believe. And I believe Paul wrote this great book of Hebrews, and especially when we get to this point. And he's saying, hey, listen, you know, you are running a race. This is a race that is set before you. And even Paul said at the end of his life, did he not say, I have finished my course. All right? I have run the race. I have kept my faith. And I have finished my course. That's why I believe he's the writer of Hebrews chapter 11 and 12. Because he's talking about that. Life is a race. So we have to physically get ourselves ready for this race that is before us. And a big part of that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call faith. It's what we call faith. If we don't have faith in God, which is the foundation of what we believe, then why are we here today? Why are we here? Even the atheists are fighting against something that they don't, they don't believe, but they're fighting against something that they say doesn't exist. Does that make sense? So I look at it and I say, that is the foundation of what we are building our life upon. And that is our faith. Our faith at the beginning of believing that Jesus Christ came to this world and he died for my sins. He took it to the cross. He took my sins to the cross. And then he took death and life and took it to a grave. And three days later, he rose from the grave and he conquered death to give me life. That is my faith. That's my foundation. But here's the thing. It doesn't stop there. If I can believe in my life that God is who he is and he's doing exactly what he says he's going to do in my life, then I need to turn everything in my life over to him. And I need to have faith that God, the same God who's going to give me eternal life that we can't imagine, that eternal life is the same God who can help me out each and every day of my life. Amen. So it's this race that we're running. Okay? And so I want to talk to you. And when I looked at the Greek word, let's pull uh, Hebrews chapter 12 or 11 verse 3 up there again. 11 verse 3. Let's look at that again. And we see this. It talks about the worlds. Do you see that in verse 3? It talks about the worlds. That is the Greek word alien, and it means ages. The ages, and it says the ages were framed, or they were prepared, or as John read in the NIV, they were formed. Okay? They were formed, they were fashioned. And I love this part, they were finished. That's what it means. The ages were finished, which means there's a picture of perseverance. Okay? And it, look at it, this frame, it's already done. 
Look at your neighbor and say, it's already done. All right? And if we're talking about exercising our faith, then we can look at Hebrews chapter 11 and say, hey, this is the push-ups that we need to faith. And, and when we look at these verses, because in the middle of those verses, because we're going to start framing this out, okay? The middle of these verses, it says are a cloud of witnesses. And these are ones who persevered. Even though they were fatigued in their faith, they persevered all the way to the end. And you have a whole list of them that are found in chapter 11 that he gives to us. Now that's that peanut butter and jelly that's coming. Because those verses say what? By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. By faith. You know, you keep going on down through there and that's what you see. And that's the peanut butter and jelly in between those two sandwiches. And we're building from that bottom sandwich of knowing, hey, we are in a race that is set before us. And this is something that has been set from the ages of past to the ages on. And it's already formed. It's already fashioned. It's already finished. And when Philippians 1 says, uh, 1, 6 says, hey, that in the beginning when God created us, okay, he created us in his own image and he's forming us, he's fashioning us, all right, to his image and what he started to do in our lives, he will finish it. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we're talking about these ages that are framed, that are prepared, that are formed, that are fashioned from the very beginning all the way through the end. And we're talking about framing today. We've been talking about unfinished business and how, remember our first message, we talked about how God was excavating our hearts and he was digging out. So when you're getting ready to build a house, you're going to excavate that ground. You're going to dig out that dirt. You're going to get, dig out all them rocks. And, and you're going to get it to where you're ready to pour the foundation in there. The footers and the foundation. Which is what we talked about the second week. Remember we talked about building our house on solid ground. And not shifting sand. So when the, when the storms and the rains and all of that come... They'll be able to stand against because our foundation is built upon Jesus Christ. He's our cornerstone. So we've talked about that. So the next phase, whenever you're, if you're in a con contracting business or construction industry, you know that now you need raw materials to start building from that foundation up. You need your 2 by 4s you need your 2x8s, your 2 by 10s you need uh, uh, gable studs and tie beams and rafters and ceiling joists and floor joists and headers and all these things and you're going to start framing this up from that foundation because when you start framing this, as this picture shows, it starts to form something that you can see, amen? When you just see the foundation, you're like, okay, what, what's going to go there? But when it starts to build up, and it starts to form and frame as we're talking about in fashion, okay? Your goal is it's a race and you're building this up and you're building it as strong as you can and you're preparing it and all of a sudden at the point when it's finished, then you have a masterpiece that's in front of you. And that's exactly what God is doing, okay? So Hebrew 11, the worlds were framed, okay? And, and God took this information and these facts and he frames it. Now there's a key word in there. How does he frame it, ladies and gentlemen? What does he say? Through what? Faith. We understand that the world's aeons, alright, they were framed by what? The word of God. So we accept Christ as our Savior by faith I'm not even knowing the Word of God. We're just hearing things that are being said and that are being told to us. We read the Bible or we hear somebody teaching the Bible. And so there comes a time, like Elizabeth Simpson, who we're going to be baptizing in a few weeks here on a Sunday morning. There comes a time in your age, in your time, when there's something different that happens in your heart like it's never done before. 
and you realize and you have faith in Christ. But from that point on, as Paul says, life is a journey. Life is a race. And if you want to get where you need to be, where God wants you to be, then you have to get in the Word of God. You have to get into the Word of God. You have to start doing devotions. You have to be in some prayer groups or Bible groups or Bible studies or Sunday schools or coming to church. How important is coming to church? Very important. I only get a few minutes with you once a week. Unless you come on Wednesday nights, I get another few minutes with you on Wednesday nights. But what do you do on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You have to get into the Word of God. You're, you, you can't just base everything on coming to church on Sunday, and then if you don't get into the Word of God throughout the week, you're going to be weak. You're not going to be strong. So everything is based upon the Word of God. That is what strengthens our faith, all right? Building a house, we have to realize what the dimensions of it are. And you begin to frame that house out. The excavation's done, the uh, pulling away those dirt and those rocks, and now the footers are pulled, that foundation is on a solid rock, and nothing can blow it away. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, okay? And we see that, and the scripture says that when God was looking around to find something that was strong enough, to build the world on, there was no substitute of raw materials such as the Word of God. So God framed and built the world which is visible through the Word which is invisible. Alright? Now we, as the children, get to imitate Him in our lives through this thing which we call faith. And then it's how that we get to take the same stuff, the same substance, the same raw materials that God used to frame the world, and then we can frame our lives with it if we choose to. And that's the same Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's from the very beginning, from the very time of the beginning, the Word of God has been here. So let me give you some things real quickly in the time we have remaining today. How we can frame this, what we call faith, into our hearts. We have to get it from here to here. Okay? Just like when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, it's not a thinking game, it's a heart game. And we go from here of understanding. We don't understand all of it, but we do understand that Jesus Christ came and He died for my sins. And we have to take that from here to here. And it's the same thing when we're framing and we have the faith. So the first thing I want you to see is what we call focus. Focus. Alright? Look at the person next to you and say, focus. All right? Get off your phones and focus on this, all right? Focus is a skill that must be sharpened continually. And I get a lot of practice with it by preaching because how well I think my sermon is going depends on which person I focused in on during the week. Now, you're probably sitting there going, is he thinking about me? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is just like last Sunday. Okay, last Sunday, I didn't know who was going to be here. I had no clue. Every week, I don't know who's going to be here from one week to the other. I don't know that. So what I do is I focus in on, okay, Lord, you give me the message that you want me to preach because you're the one that will know who's going to be here and who's not going to be here. So when he starts working on me, because I can, you know, when we get into series like this, you can, you can, you know, pull from this and pull from that. And then you're thinking, okay, I got this done. And then God comes along and says, no, you don't, no, 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 no. You need to change this and you need to change this and you need to change this. Because there's going to be certain people there this Sunday that need to hear exactly what I want to tell them. Okay, so I have to be obedient to that, but I have to focus in on what God wants. I have to zoom in on what God wants me. So in our lives, we're called this world, as the Word of God said, that God framed. Okay, He framed. So that's what we're going to work on today. We're framing 
our lives in Him. So what we have at the beginning is what I want you to see in this picture, okay? Now, don't sit back here and say, what in the world does a guitar have to do with anything that you're talking about? Don't focus on what the picture is except Steve Krause, because he loves guitars, all right? And that's a beautiful one. I don't know if you can really see it. Either. But if you look at it, what do you see? You see a hand and a little bit of the guitar, don't you? Now, that is what we call focusing in. That's what we call framing in. There's things in our lives, when it comes to faith, that we need in our time, in times of our life, we need to focus in on that one thing. Okay? Because what can happen is if we don't in life and in our faith, we can get distracted from all kinds of things. And, and uh, so I want to I I take, for example, Peter, okay? Peter's a great example of what I'm trying to say when I'm talking about focus. Right now, I'm focusing on this picture, and I see a hand that's, that's just playing that guitar. And that's all I can see. And I, that's what I want you to focus in on, because that's all you can see. And there's things in our life that we need to do that sometimes, too. And we need to focus in on just a close-up, you know, a zoom-in on something that's like, because all this other stuff can be a distraction. And Peter's a great example. Do you remember when Peter walked on water? Do you remember that? You can find it in Matthew 14, 29. We'll put it up here. And he said, come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, what does that say, church? He walked on the water. How many of you in this room have walked on water? Some of you tried. It didn't, it didn't go good. well, did it? All right? Now, here's the key. It says that he walked on water. So that tells me he actually walked on the water. Now, remember last week I was telling you about Sneaky Jesus? Because Sneaky Jesus came out on the water. He was walking to them when they were out on the ship. Because what was happening? They were afraid. Their faith was not in God or Christ at that moment. Their faith was in the winds and the storms that were howling around them. And they were so afraid that they were going to uh, uh, be shipwrecked and, and die out there. And here comes Jesus walking across the sea. And he's walking to them. And he calls out to Peter. Now why does he call out to Peter? Think about that for just a moment. Of all the men that were there, he calls out to Peter because he knew Peter's heart. And he knew Peter was going to try it. And Peter, he said, come. And he walked on water. Now here's the key right here. Why, what was he walking on water to do? What does it say there, church? To go to Jesus. So think about this picture right now. This picture, this close-up of this guitar. That is Jesus. This is a picture of Jesus. So here, this moment, this time, Peter frames in just Jesus. He frames in just Jesus at this moment in his life. So while he's fixed on Jesus and he's framed on Jesus, his faith takes over because that's what he's fixed on. And he begins to what? Walk on water. Because it says he's going to Jesus. He's, he's fixed. But a lot of times, we lose that focus. And we let other things, we widen the lens, as this next picture shows. And not only do we see the person playing the guitar, but we see other people that are on stage with him playing instruments. And now our minds... And our thoughts are going back and forth. Am I right? So what happened is Peter walks out on that sea. And the Bible says he walked on the water. Because his faith was fixed on Jesus. But once he widened that lens. And began to see the winds and the storms. The Bible says that he began to sink. Does that make sense? 
And you think about it, he begins to sink. So at a moment he was fixed, but then he allowed the distractions of life to take that fix off of Christ. Now here's what I want to tell you. The winds and the storms were already there. Yeah. Weren't they? Yeah. They were already there. But because his eyes were fixed on Christ, who's the author and the finisher of our faith, Peter had faith to walk on water. And he did it. Until he widened that flame out. And then he saw the winds and the waves. Now, we can't blame him because the winds and the waves were there, but they were already there when he was walking on the water. But when we allow things in our frame, when we allow that to break our focus, our faith becomes weakened. And listen to me, you will never build a solid faith with a weak focus. You get that? You'll never build a solid faith with a weak focus. Focus, focus, focus. That's what we need to do. And all we have to do is focus. The next thing is called reference. When you see reference here, that is what we're talking about, frame of reference. So the writer of Hebrews said, God started the world with his word. And that same word by which if we receive it, you will receive a measure of faith. And then you frame your world according to the same word that God spoke the universe into existence with. And he's given us a frame of reference all the way to Jesus who endured the shame of the cross through faith. It's a frame of reference. We're suffering, we're a suffering church and he's given this a frame of reference reminding us of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And, and this is the picture inside that frame. This is the peanut butter and jelly that's inside that, those two pieces of bread. And he's given us a picture. And he's given us a reference to that. And we often need that frame of reference, don't we? I don't know about you, but on Wednesday nights we've been studying the life of David. And it's so good to see, even though David was a man after God's own heart, it's good to see David don't mess up. You know what I'm saying? I don't mean that in a bad way. I kind of do, but I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm thinking, hey, if a man who is considered to be after God's own heart messes up and God forgives him, now he had to pay the consequence of his messing up. But if he can do that and God still loves him and considers him a man after his own heart, that gives me hope. Amen? So what I'm doing is this. And here's the thing that we need to do. When I say reference, it's not just always to some people. The Bible gives us this Word of God. We talked about how God framed the worlds with the Word of God. This Word of God is given to you and I so we can reference from it. Good old Job. How many of you ever felt like you were going through what Job went through? All right? It's a reference. But here's the one I want, I want you to see too. Not only do we have the references that are mentioned by faith, the, of the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, but you have past history that you can reference back to. Amen? How many times have you been in a situation where you thought, man, there's no way I'm going to come out of this situation. There's no hope in this situation. There's nothing I can do. I'm doomed. And all of a sudden, you can reference back to another time that you felt that and God got you through it. And he made you a better person than what you were before. You can reference back to that as well. Okay, we're doing this and that's what we're seeing. Now, here's the third thing. Anticipation. I'm building something here, by the way, if you can't see. I'm framing something. We have to anticipate something to change for us to be ready for it. And some of you just set the frame. You just set the frame and you walk out a picture. And it's blank and you put yourself in situations you don't need to be putting yourself in. I, you know, here's the thing that, I, that, that this came to me the other day and I wrote it down. I don't want to know where God was. I want to be where God is. Amen? 
I don't want to be where God was in my life. I want to be where God is in my life. Okay? So when we look at this, I think about you anticipate. What faith and fear both share in common in our lives is they're both empowered by anticipation. So if you wake up in the morning and you frame your day with the anticipation of fear, if you frame your day with the anticipation of anxieties, if you frame your day with the anticipation of discouragement or loneliness or betrayal, then listen to me. Because you framed your morning out to have those things and those distractions within your frame, guess what you're going to do during that day? You're going to have anxieties. You're going to be lonely. You're going to be betrayed. You're, you're setting yourself up that. So what we have to do is like I did this morning. I anticipated, I anticipated that this is the day of the Lord and I will be glad in it. All right. This is, as the psalmist said, this is the day that the Lord has made. What was he saying? He was framing his day and he said, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I don't know, but I'll be glad. I don't know what today holds, but I'm going to be glad. I'm going to anticipate something that's great that's going to happen in my life. Now, let's look at the, the, second, the fourth one, motivation. Motivation. We were anticipating that you would be here today because God said, hey, I want to give you a message that's going to reach people that will be there Sunday. And I was anticipating that, and that motivates me. It motivates me. Right frame of mind how people look to me as being a pastor here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, that motivates me to do what's right. Someone, uh, one of my workers who never stepped foot in church before was here last Sunday. I've been asking him for a year and a half to come, and he was here last Sunday. And he looked at me and he said, he said, what I was impressed about was how in the world you can get up there with all the people in that and talk like that. He says, how can you do that? And I said, by the grace of God. The grace of God. And it's, it's God all the way. I can tell you right now, it's God all the way. Because when I first started preaching, I, my sermons were 10 minutes. And some of you probably sitting there going, why can't it be that way now? <laughs> They, they were good. I mean, if, if I did 10 minutes, that was good. And I preached like this the whole time. And someone said, how in the world can you preach to people looking out in the crowd and seeing people, seeing what they're doing, seeing if they're sleeping, seeing... Doesn't that distract you? No, it doesn't distract me because I frame you. No, I don't frame any of you. I'm being honest with you this morning. I scan. I don't even see your faces. You know why? Because I'm scanning the top of your heads. That's what I'm doing. Because I don't want to frame in on you. Because I don't want to be, I don't want to get distracted. You see what I'm saying? So what I do when I'm up here, I frame out. I frame Jesus. I frame the Spirit of God. And I say, hey, you know, because some of you, if I just framed in on you, you'd kill me. You literally would kill me because I'm sitting there going, really? Is that what you do every time I preach? And it would just absolutely kill me, crush me the rest of the day. So I don't frame any of you in my picture. That's what I frame. Now you're sitting there going, is he looking over my head? Or is it, you know, I'm up above you, so you can't tell, right? All right. But you, I'm saying all that says, you motivate me. You motivate me because I have a calling that is so important. And you, the people of this church, motivate me. And I think about these verses here. The motivation that Christ had of going to the cross. Jesus, for the joy set before him. What is that? That's you. While he was on the cross, while he was being crucified, while he was having to endure up to the cross and on the cross was pure motivation. 
For the glory of his Father and for the salvation of creation is what kept him on that cross the entire time. Every time he got beat with the cat of nine tails that ripped his flesh right off of his back and the pain was so heavy that it knocked him to his knees and every time the soldier said stay down that what is what motivated him to get himself back up and he pulled himself back up and he said church beat me some more why because he was motivated by us and that's the beautiful picture of it every time he fell beneath the weight of the cross Walking down on Via Del Rosa to Calvary. He framed it up. He got back up. He was motivated. There was no distraction in his way. He was focused on Calvary. He was focused up on that hill. And that's what he was framing in at that moment. And the motivation is what was uh, motivating him to get up to that cross and fulfill what God had called him to do. Every time they drove the nails into his wrist, he framed out motivation. And he would offer the other hand. And then he would offer his feet. And every time he felt like quitting, he framed out pure motivation. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Amen. Because... There's times in our lives where we have to focus in. That's that tight shot. And we have to focus in. Maybe it's our marriage. Maybe it's our finances. Maybe it's our faith. Maybe it's our children. And there's times that we have to focus <coughs> up close. And not allow, allow anything else to distract. And there was times that Jesus had to do that. He had to do that with the Samaritan woman. Amen? He had to do that with the woman that was caught in adultery. He had to tight shot, focus in on her. But I'm so thankful that the motivation, there, were, there was times when he focused in, but I'm so thankful that the, motive, the anticipation and the motivation is what drove him to Calvary. Because when he got on the cross, his picture was not focused in on one single person anymore. His picture widened out. Mm. And it's what we call the establishing shot. And he's seen the world, cosmos, and he died. He died for you. He died for me. Because he was focused. The last thing I close with is elimination. The Bible says that if we're going to do this, if we're going to frame out our life, if we're going to frame out our faith, if we're going to build from that foundation up and start allowing God to do his thing in our lives piece by piece, metal by metal, screw by screw, nail by nail. We're going to let him frame our lives up like that where it starts to look like something and starts to structure out. Then you and I have to eliminate every weight and sin that needs to be removed in Hebrews 12.1. That's what we have to do in our lives. And when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, what happens is the frame takes place in our lives. That frame that is there, and it just builds something that God wants to build. And it's a masterpiece at the end. Would you allow God to frame your life today? Would you allow God, because we are unfinished, and we want to get to that point where we are finished, but would you allow God to put piece by piece together for you? Let Him frame it out by faith, by faith, by faith. That single shot that you need to focus in on, by faith, you can get that taken care of. That bigger picture, by faith, you can get that taken care of. 
Thank God. Let's bow our heads. Heaven, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for allowing us to understand that we are a finished. We are not a finished product at all. And every day of our lives is going to be a new challenge. Every day. And what we had faith in yesterday to help us get through that day and have victory in our life is the same faith that we need today to help us get through it. And we can reference back to that. And we can anticipate you doing something great in our lives each and every day. Each and every day. And that is what can motivate us to keep running this course. Keep running this race. And as we run this way, race, may we throw off everything in our lives that so easily holds us down and gets our focus off what we need to focus in on. The big picture to us is heaven. We can only imagine. Heaven. That's the picture. As Paul said, I have fought the fight. I've given it everything I have. Now, I'm ready to be offered up. Now, the goal all along was heaven. This earth has brought me some joy. This earth has brought me some great things in life. But it will not compare to what I have waiting for me. I'm ready to go home. Paul said, I'm ready to go home. May we have that picture in our heart. Our frame should be you. And the whole picture should be our goal is to be in heaven. Where at last, we're totally free. And where at last, we're finished. We're complete. Until then, run a race. And the race is going to be rocky sometimes. It's going to be hills, mountains, valleys. But help us continue to run that race. Times of just focusing in on you. And times of focusing on family. Times of focusing on our jobs, our finances, our marriages, our children, everything. Help us to know when to do what we need to do and when to do it and how to do it. We ask this in 